Uh, that was <laughs> playing around with the music and missing my marks. Welcome to today's Fixing Your Agile Coaching. I'm Ryan Ripley. This is Melissa Boggs. Melissa, how are you today? I am well. How are you, Ryan? I'm great. I'm excited you're back for another week of the show. Feels like just moments ago we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's the magic of the internet. Um, for those of you that not that, who did not catch last week's show, uh, Melissa is uh, Agile Coach Extraordinaire, certified enterprise coach, certified team coach, former co-CEO of the Scrum Alliance, currently vice president of business agility at Sauce Labs. She's awesome. I'm excited she's here to speak with us. She brings a great topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, again, it seems like I just I love the topics and the things that she's thinking about. So it's great that we get a chance to dig into these. Helping the helpers, the care and feeding of Scrum Masters. But it'd be great if I would actually spell this correctly. Look at this. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> the magic of the internet. What problem? What problem? <laughs> All right, the care and feeding of Scrum Masters. What is this all about, Melissa? What What's on your mind here? Hmm. So um, I'm going to tell you a different story first, actually. We're going to cool. start with a story. Yay. So when I was a kid, I was always the person, or the student in class, who wondered about the teacher. Okay. Which is super weird, I know. But I remember being in like fourth grade, and I had one of those like really cool, young, hip female teachers. And I remember it was like getting close to Christmas and I thought, man, like she's doing all these things for us, right? We had all these like Christmas and Hanukkah decorations and she brought us little gifts and trinkets and stuff. And I thought, who is taking care of her? And mm -hmm. who, um, you know, is anyone bringing her Christmas gifts or is she, when she's sick, does anyone take care of her? And it sounds a little bit strange to be like a fourth grader thinking about these things, but I think it just always occurred to me that the people who are pouring out are always pouring out. And especially when your job, like being a teacher or being a scrum master is pouring out. And, you know, in her case, I'm sure she had, you know, parents or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, you know, someone taking care of her. But this sort of came up for me again when twice, one, when I was a scrum master and frankly, I felt very alone. Like sure. often scrum masters are the only people in their organization who do what they do, who understand what they do <laughs> and really understand how trying that servant leadership can actually be. Um, and then it came up for me again, you know, later on in my career when I was helping mentoring, working with scrum masters as I was sort of hearing that message from them over and over, like no one gets what I do. And this whole notion of servant leadership, while I completely agree with it, live into it, it sort of encourages you to constantly put your needs second. If you are serving a team, then you are expected to sort of, you know, care more about what's going on in the team than your own career, right? Like the expectation of your career will come, yeah, your career will come as a result of the work that you do with this team. Right. And that's great and probably true, but that can make it really lonely and that can be really draining. And so it's up to whoever is around them, whether that be their leaders, coaches, um, you know, their executive leadership to be paying attention because they are not likely to raise their hand and say, I need help or I'm tired or I want career development right. because we've told them over and over that their needs are second to everyone else. Yeah, it, that's a that's an awesome setup. You know, I was thinking through kind of my experiences as a scrum master and you almost yeah, you kind of lose yourself in the service to others and you lose your objectives and then who's I like the way you framed it with the teacher like who's help who's helping the teacher, right? Who's supporting the teacher and it is a lonely job and most time um you're not getting the support 
from others, you're often defending your role, right? Mm -hmm. How many times has a developer asked you, well, what do you, what exactly do you do? Right. Or, you know, it's like, it's like the movie office space. Like, what would you say you actually do here? You know, and, and that gets exhausting after a while. And it, um, and so, yeah, so I, I'm assuming this is from an agile coach perspective, like the care and feeding of scrum masters. So what are the things that we can pour into our scrum masters? Like, how can we help lift them up? How do we um, almost like re-energize or, or I'm not think maybe I'm not thinking of the right framing, but what are the things that you would expect an agile coach to do in this space uh, to kind of help with this particular situation? You actually tapped right into it. Cool. <laughs> so there's a couple of things. Um, so yes, energize. And that may come in the form of encouragement, like literally sitting back and looking for the, the things that they're doing well and, and not only making those clear to them, but then elevating them, you know, helping the people in the organization to understand what they do so they don't have to defend themselves all the time. And, you know, how important their role is. Because again, we keep, rightly so, but we keep iterating to them, be humble. Yeah. And that means that they don't always learn how to advocate for themselves, you know, and, and how important that they are. Um, so there's energizing, there's encouraging, and then there's elevating. Um, and then there's sort of enlightenment. <laughs> And sure. I kind of mean that for like a couple of different people. So there's the enlightenment of the organization as to what they do. And then there's also sort of their own enlightenment in terms of professional development. You know, like another thing I've seen often is that the scrum master's role is unclear. And then also so is the career path that comes after that. Right. Um, so I'm actually working right now in my org with, I have seven scrum masters and the beauty of that role is you can go a bunch of different places. You know, it's not a given that every scrum master is going to want to go on and work with, you know, many, many teams and become an enterprise coach. Like it's not a given. And so, you know, can I, having can I hop in right there? Yeah. Because you just, I think that's actually a terrible path. I don't <laughs> think that actually makes sense necessarily for a scrum master. Right. I, right. But, but that is, it, it's almost like the same career pathing for a software developer. I remember being told if you want to make the real money, once you're done being a software dev, you got to become a project manager, then a manager, and then an executive. And uh, what a weird thing to tell a developer. Right. Right. But with a scrum master, I mean, I, I, I love where you're going here and I, I, I should probably just be quiet and let you keep going, but it, that is such a weird path. That's like, we want you to go from being an excellent team coach. Like this is your passion, your drive, your skill set, And we want you to go, go big. Wait, what if, what if, a, and, and I, if I'm stealing thunder, yell at me, but what if it's one particular scrum master would make an amazing HR person and mm -hmm. another scrum master would be an amazing CEO someday, which is your kind of your path, right? I mean, it's, I think the scrum master role prepares us for executive leadership. I think it prepares us for um, people teams like HR, right? I think it prepares us for, um, like you said, such a diverse range that simply trying to scale. It's like, why are we always trying to scale in Scrum, whether it's the framework or the people? Um, why are we trying to scale up? I mean, we should be branching out, right? I'll tell you part of it. And, you know, I'm a part of the system, so I'm just going to own it. But it's in part because of how some of our certification frameworks exist. Sure. And, and some of them exist that way. You know, you go like, um, scrum master advanced yep. professional team enterprise. And a lot of times it's aligned with who is your audience and how much are they willing to pay? Sure. Right. Like an enterprise coach is going to command more because they have the, the attention of executives. Right. And the funny thing is like, I've always said, and we're kind of going off the original topic, but I hope that's okay. Right. But I've always said, like I have worked with some, amazing coaches that absolutely kick my behind when it comes to working with teams. Like I'm great with teams. I like teams, but they kick my behind. Sure. But I can go and work with, you know, P 
people in leadership roles and I get them and we can work together and I do well there. So that doesn't make me superior to those people. You right. know, it just means we have a different skill set and a different background. And so it's just interesting to me because to your point, kind of bringing it all back, it's like care and feeding of these scrum masters means really listening to what their skill set and their background is and asking them, you know, where do you see your journey going? Like of my group right now, I have, I have a couple who are interested in kind of going down a classic path, if you want to call it that, I have a couple who want to be product managers, product owners, have, you know, one or two that want to do something else entirely. And like, that's awesome because yeah. that means that they're multifaceted as a team. And that means they can go and like, you know, be brilliant up, down, sideways, everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think part of that is just paying attention and not making assumptions, you know, about where they're going. Yeah. The, the one size fits all tracks or which is, I think, in a lot of places. But I also think um, as an agile coach, I, I've advocated in the past for can we just pay this amazing software engineer more money to be an amazing software engineer instead of making them take on the role of a manager or or some other perceived higher role when we really just want to retain this person, reward their expertise, reward their discipline in sticking with a craft for this long and becoming amazing. Mm -hmm. Why can't we just reward that financially without having to pile on all of these other responsibilities because their contributions are, it's amazing. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's something that has always baffled me in this space too. And with scrum masters, why can't we just love the fact that we have a scrum master who's amazing with teams and pay them as their skills level up without forcing them down an arbitrary career path. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Um, but I didn't mean to turn this into career pathing for scrum masters, but I think care and feeding, maybe this still ties in. Hopefully it's yeah. still tangential to, to your topic. No, that's exactly. I mean, no, it's, it is it. I mean, that's a big yeah. part of it is just, I mean, the way, especially it's one thing if you're an agile coach, but if you're also, you know, kind of a, uh, what do they call it? Like a functional leader, then you have to understand these options. You have to understand, you know, again, what that particular scrum master needs in terms of care. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of how we got down that tangent. <laughs> well, and, and I think, you know, everyone on a scrum team needs this. I can't tell you how many times, and, and Todd tells stories of this too, that I'm sure people have heard if you've listened to some of our other shows that as a scrum master, there are times where I would just schedule a meeting with our product owner just to get them out of the crosshairs of stakeholders and the team and the customers and the you because everyone had their sights on this person. Schedule 30 minutes to talk about the Cubs game last night and just see how they're doing and give them 30 minutes to decompress. And maybe I think that's care and feeding. And we can do that for scrum masters. You know, agile coaches, I hope you know when the scrum masters you're working with, and I'm not trying to create hierarchies. I'm just, I'm being, I'm a realist that they're, we're all working in the same spaces. Um, hopefully you realize sometimes your scrum masters are just getting beaten down and maybe you schedule an hour and say, Hey, I bought some cookies. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm not, you know, I don't want to go down a weird path of just be, be in the food order, but sometimes it's great to just create decompression space. You know, I know that that's something that, that I've seen done. Is that also in line with where we're going and any stories around those kind of ideas? I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, sometimes they're often, they're the ones doing that for other people. And right. so that's sort of like the whole helping the helpers thing. Um, one of the phrases that I've heard is people often put out into the world what it is that they need, right? Because that's the lens by which they see. So if you see a scrum master who's like really pouring into their team in a certain way, yeah. it might be worth saying, hey, who's doing that for you? You know, do you need a dozen cookies or do you need right. a walk a walk around the building outside for a few minutes? Um, so with that, I'm gonna ask you, Ryan, I'm turning it around. Okay. I'm asking you a question. Do it. So let's rewind back to when you were a scrum master and maybe a fairly new scrum master. Okay. What do you wish that someone had given you? <sighs> That's a good question. I wish uh, very early on um, someone would give uh, just a little bit of cover 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, and, and what I mean is I feel like the, when, when I've learned scrum, I was in a very corporate environment and we were trying some experiments and we weren't lying, but we were being very careful about what we, I mean, we always told the truth about what we were doing. We reported things up accurately, but I also, I always felt like if we had gotten caught, if people knew everything that we were doing, it would have been trouble and, and maybe some cover for that instead of having to to worry so much about, wow, should we really publish a definition of done? Is that level of, I mean, transparency was kind of scary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, getting, you know, why, why is that whole team meeting every morning for 15 minutes? What's going, why are they, why aren't they at their desk type? And it was those kind of questions that we were constantly deflecting. And I think someone just stepping in and saying, Hey, this is a team that they're trying something. Uh, we're going to leave them alone for a little bit. We're going to see what kind of outcomes they almost like the permission to experiment. Maybe that's the mm-hmm. better way to put it. Um, and also a little cover in case, you know, every once in a while, a sprint failed. You know, right. I think those kind of things, I think, would have been really useful early on. Yeah, I agree. If I ask myself the same question, actually, I think I was really lucky that I had a lot of what I would have wished for, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, similar to what you just described, I worked with an incredible set of people actually at two different companies. Um, so it's one of those things where, you know, one by one, we left one place and then followed each other to the other sure. place. And they were constantly giving me cover when I was right. a young scrum master. And this was um, like a manager of engineering or engineering manager at the time, a product manager. And we sort of did that for each other. But I think I was the most vulnerable because everyone knew what they did, right? Everyone knows what or thinks they know is what an engineering manager or product manager do. And so, yeah, I mean, they provided, it wasn't even my boss. It was my peers that were providing this, you know, care and this cover that I needed. So, you know, I think that's a good reminder too, to us as coaches, that it's not just the scrum masters that we need to look out for, but each other. Yeah. And it's, it's an awareness, right. And to take it out of the workspace. I mean, there are times where, um, and I'm sure that, um, you and your significant other have the same kind of ideas here, but I'll notice where if I've been in my office too much, right? Cause I'm, I'm incredibly busy. Like we're running a company. We do a lot of teaching. I'm working on a master's degree. I'm, I'm in here a lot reading or talking or doing these vid- I, I'm gone even though I'm home and I'll notice like my wife has taken the kids to, to baseball and football and two doctor's appointments and did the back to school. And every once in a while I have to emerge and say, wow, I've left way too much of this with you. How can mm-hmm. I help? Like, what can I do here? Because it's just so out of balance. And, and some nights it's, why don't I, I'll take care of dinner. Um, I know you've been talking about that pedicure. Go do that. Go grab your friend, disappear for five, six hours. Go get a drink afterwards. Go do it. Whatever it is you need to do. Uh, but even just the awareness that when you see someone after emerging from the office that, wow, they've just taken a lot and they're exhausted or they're tired or they need, you know, something poured back into them. And, and I think that that awareness, just looking outside of yourself is probably a really good habit to start cultivating. If you don't have it now, does that mm-hmm. kind of, does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Yep. So and frankly, I think as a community, we would all be better off if we would just do that with each other. Yeah. Rather than arguing about something, just looking and saying, wow, are you okay? <laughs> and if yep. and 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 then asking it again because the first time they'll lie to you, right? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I, I'm fine. Okay, enough. Now, really, what <laughs> are you? Okay? <laughs> and and I think that in and of itself would be like the killer tip for this, you know. Well, I gotta say, you are excellent at that. So okay. <laughs> I appreciate that from you. And yeah, I think that's it's not just your scrum masters, although let's give them some extra. Oh yeah, care. Um, but yeah, we should also be doing the same for each other. I love that. I think that's probably a good place to leave it. What do you think, Melissa? I think so. Nice. And so Melissa, thank you for this topic. Thank you for humoring my tangents and thank you for keeping us in line, um, and bringing it, bringing it back to something very meaningful, which you always do, which is, I think one of your superpowers and thanks for being here. Really appreciate you doing this. Always fun. It is always fun. And I hope all of you out there got a lot out of it too. Leave your comments below, leave your questions, leave your thoughts, leave your stories. You know, how do you help 
the care and feeding of your scrum masters. Like and subscribe so that you know when we drop new videos. There's probably some videos that are going to pop up below that might be related that could help. Check those out too. But uh, yeah, for this week, you know, if someone out there is struggling, help them out. If uh, you haven't checked on someone in a while, send them a message, shoot them a text, give them a call. And uh, don't take the first answer because they're never fine. <laughs> Ask again and uh, see if you can help someone out this week. All right. We'll see you next week, everybody. Uh, take care. <laughs>